I give the Liberals a lot of flack, and rightly so, because they are, after all, the ones who sent me and my mates to war, and some of us never came back. Some of us came back damaged. The centre, Blairism, Blairites and the people around him who did that. As soon as the flights to Kabul are suspended, the centrists are suddenly war horny. War. It's fantastic. All of a sudden they're ready to put on their tin hat and get in the trenches. And of course it's ridiculous. I don't think they'd last five seconds in a place like that. I'm sure they would just completely collapse. That said, I mean, go for it. If these people are keen to go and fight the Taliban, bang them on a plane, send them out, parachute them into Kabul. Our elite strike team of Tony Blair's mates and Alistair Campbell and maybe Brian McFadden, I'm absolutely down for that spectacle. Send them in. As a former soldier who served in Afghanistan, it saddens me, but I'm going to be honest with you and tell you that the last 20 years in Afghanistan was a complete waste of time, waste of money, waste of lives. I have lots of friends in the military who suffered very badly. I know people who died in Afghanistan, friends who took their lives. I sympathise with those people because they are my people. They're part of my composition. I was a soldier and I have sympathy with veterans, but I always try and emphasise that wherever the problems we had, we still go home. Afghans are home and all those problems, they're exacerbated by the fact they can't get out. The primary victims are always going to be and have always been the Afghans. I was in Afghanistan last year. My main role there was to examine the zero units, which are militias of Afghan troops run by the CIA, so they're unaccountable to Congress, so they're unaccountable to the Afghan government. We're involved in various atrocities. We spoke to people in Jalalabad, the family of four brothers who were murdered and weapons were dropped on their body to frame them as terrorists. They weren't involved in the insurgency at all. We went out to a very remote village in a Toyota Corolla, absolutely terrifying on ID stricken roads. Their village was attacked. We spoke to a man, his son sought refuge next to the mosque. They dropped a Hellfire missile on the mosque. They dug his son's body out a few days later. The Zero units came in, killed various people, ruined a lot of the infrastructure, burned the petrol station, which is a major local source of income. Some people did benefit from the war in Afghanistan. Your average Afghan isn't among those people. I'm not among them. Arms firms benefited from the war in Afghanistan. Military contractors, mercenary firms. A lot of those people have squirreled their money away. They've cut and run, butchered and bolted, as we used to say about British imperial adventures. It's an age of terror, but it's also an age of massive deceit. But in some cases, self-deceit. Defeated nations and defeated armies have to come up with alibis as to why they lost. It's an enemy within. In Vietnam, it was the hippies. The hippies betrayed our veterans. And the same thing will happen here. They will blame the left. They will blame the anti-war movement. Whatever you think of them, objectively, everything the anti-war movement said 20 years ago has come to pass, almost word for word. The issue of Afghanistan goes on. The deaths continue, the soldiers continue to die, the war is clearly unwinnable. The real culprits, the liars and the deceivers, the press barons, the arms firms, the politicians, with honourable exceptions, all of whom have come out of this scot-free, it really speaks to just the political culture and the media culture in Britain. And the Campbells, the Blairs, the butchers of Baghdad and Basra, are still seen as serious people. It's unbelievable. All the Afghan voices you could cite, all the Iraqi or Libyan voices you could cite, all the critics in the West that you could cite and talk to, as if these fools and these clowns and these failures are serious people who should be listened to. Bush's rehabilitation is one strange and sad feature of this. George Bush, Prince Harry, an Afghan veteran, shaking hands, joking on stage. These two, these two are a right pair. <laughs> there you have the architect of their mutilation and injury. That, for me as a veteran, was particularly irksome. These people have been reconditioned to such an extent, but rehabilitated by liberals. They've reduced him to this slightly eccentric old man who likes painting, and not what he is, which is, of course, a war criminal. The art community wasn't exactly my base of support when I ran for office. <laughs> <laughs> if you've followed the news about Afghanistan beyond the headlines, the fact that the Afghan army capitulated very quickly isn't that shocking. It's still on the British Army website that they've trained 350,000 soldiers in Afghanistan. Between 100,000 and 200,000 were just ghost soldiers. Their wages was being pocketed by corrupt officials, dodgy generals. The shock in this country probably speaks to the media narrative, which has repeated government press releases on the progress in Afghanistan 
almost verbatim. The reality on the ground is that beyond Kabul and a few other major cities with a major military presence, the government's grip and by extension the Western grip on power in Afghanistan was always fairly tenuous. It's hard to say what will happen now. There have been some bizarre Adam Curtis-esque images of young Taliban fighters riding merry-go-rounds, going to the gym and riding bumper cars in a fairground in Kabul. Whether the Taliban 2.0 is the same as the Taliban of 96 or 2001, I don't know. Time will only tell, but we know they're a deeply reactionary conservative force. There are concerns that the Taliban will come in and their presence will diminish human rights, and they're justified concerns. But it's also true that the occupation diminished human rights. The British military, the Australian military, the US military, the various murders and massacres of innocent Afghans, the drone war, all of these are human rights issues. The inquiry found credible evidence that 39 Afghan men and teenagers had been unlawfully killed. Allegations include junior soldiers being coerced into executing prisoners to get their first kill and that weapons were planted on victims to make it look like the killings were legitimate. This man told us about the day his brother was allegedly killed by Australian troops. We were fishing and having a picnic. Around noon, the foreigners carried out their raid. They arrested my brother and took him to a corner. A few minutes later, they shot him in the head three times, and once in his stomach. The argument that we intervene in places and that doing so helps women and children. It's a really, really insidious argument which is made by people who would consider themselves liberals. Let's face it, that's where that comes from. In the army we, we have a term for that, it's called bullshit. I just don't buy it. And if you are concerned about women, then you would look at places like Saudi Arabia, a close ally, recipient of millions of dollars worth of military equipment. The condition of women in Libya were after intervention, there were slave markets, literal slave markets. Black skin is a commodity in Libya. We are sold at cheap prices like chickens. In Afghanistan, 40% of people who were killed in airstrikes were children. That is our airstrikes. Husbands, fathers, mothers, wives and many, many children. The youngest was just three months old. We tend to see Afghanistan through the prism of Kabul, which is anomalous. It's the centre of foreign military power. When I was in Kabul, I saw girls wearing jeans, women riding bikes, and that's all good. But in the majority of Afghanistan, nothing much changed. And when you occupy a place and bring war to someone's doorstep, all the things that women face, all the prejudices and problems and inequalities that women face normally in everyday life are exacerbated. You're adding to their problems when you bring war and occupation to their country. We have to get away from this idea that the British military or the American military or any military is some kind of lib femme organisation which is in the business of going around rescuing women. It's profoundly condescending. Even when we look at Afghanistan, the gains which women did make are often attributed to foreign military power, never to the struggles of women in those countries, which has included their resistance to the foreign occupation and the Taliban. These people have fought on two fronts to make the few gains that they do have. And I just find that whole line of argument really disingenuous and just insidious. The British establishment, the press barons, the hawks in Labour and the Conservative Party will obviously continue to try and tie themselves to American power. But there is an opportunity here for an even-handed analysis and a reckoning. And that won't come from above. It will have to come from below. This is an opportunity for us to divest from American power, accept the fact the age of pith helmets has gone, move away from the mythology of global Britain and become a sensible, normal country and play an even-handed role in the world. And the first thing we can do to do that is to save as many people as we can, to let as many Afghans who want to come here and can get out come here. These people are in a dire situation because of us, because of us. The scenes of crowds of people running alongside a military cargo plane will become the defining images of the era, as will the image of a Chinook over the embassy. Of course, it's not literally Saigon, but the parallels are unmistakable. I don't think you can get away from that. If there is one lesson, it is that liberal interventionism is dead. It's done, it's gone, it's over, and we need to find other ways to engage with the world. A key lesson of recent years is that mainstream media isn't doing what it's supposed to do. It's not informing us. Outlets like Double Down News are filling that gap, and it's vital that you support them so we can be informed, we can know what's going on in the world, so that we can make decisions about what we do in the future. So please support Double Down News on Patreon.